I think that you're going to see DeSantis supporters, whether some of them on social media are still salty or not, they're still going to galvanize around Donald Trump, certainly not Nikki Haley and certainly not a Democrat. So I think right now you have people that just have some sour grapes that they got to get over. And I also hope that the Trump supporters that were really vicious to the DeSantis supporters, I hope that they give that up as well, because it just isn't helpful on either side. Anybody who thinks that Donald Trump's going to win all these swing states and he's just going to clean house. Unfortunately, I think they have some selective amnesia about what happened in 2020. This is not going to be easy, my friends. Welcome to the Sean Spicer Show, folks. It is Friday. I hope you're listening today. But if you want to wait until the weekend, I don't hold that against you. Sit back, relax. A lot happened this week. Uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, he's saying no way, Jose, when it comes to his state's ability to defend itself from illegal immigrants. Donald Trump asking the party coalesce around him as we head out of the New Hampshire primary. So much to get to. Our guest today, Tommy Laren, host of Tommy Laren, is fearless. Let's get into it with her right now. Tommy, welcome to the show. I, you know, I've always been honored to be on yours. It's so great for you to join us today and, uh, and have this conversation. Oh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me as always. Thank you for always coming on Tommy Lahren is Fearless. We always love having you and your insights, especially in election season. So I'm happy to be on the other side and I'm ready for the questions you got for me. <laughs> okay. Well then let's let's get to it. So this week, Ron DeSantis had, you know, dropped out at the beginning. Trump wins in New Hampshire. He's making this big call for everyone to coalesce around him. Haley wants to play it out for a little while longer. I, I, I I'm not really sure. Talk to me about what your where you see this race right now. So I've been talking about this all week. I don't think we're going to see Nikki Haley drop out anytime soon unless her donors leave her in mass because right now she's got the funding. And I've been thinking, I know that it might sound like a conspiracy theory, but you know, you actually said something similar to me last week and it really got me thinking about it. I think that she's kind of like a vulture circling. She's hoping that something's going to happen legally to Donald Trump, and then she will be there to maybe pick up the pieces. Maybe she'll be the one there that can you know, rush in and, and take the nomination, or at least that's what her donors are telling her. So I really am of the opinion that Nikki Haley is sitting around waiting to pick up the scraps should something really horrible happen legally to Donald Trump, like he ends up behind bars before the general election. That's really what I think she's waiting for. And I don't think she's worried about having a political future. I think Ron DeSantis knew that he's got a great opportunity in 2028. He doesn't want to burn bridges. So he decided it would be best for the party and best for his future if he got out while he still could save some face. Nikki Haley, I don't think she wants 2028. I think she's betting it all on 2024. And if it doesn't work out for her, she'll go to the board of something and make a lot of unearned money. And I think she's just happy with that. So I think Nikki Haley is about herself and her donors hate Donald Trump. So she's going to stay in for as long as they keep rolling the money her way. You think maybe the, the concern with the, that's happening at Boeing, she went, I don't know that I even have a board to go back to anymore. So maybe I just have to stick, at that, stick this out. I think she thinks that the more she raises her name ID and the more coveted she is, maybe she can get some speaking gigs. I mean, she really does follow in the pathway of Hillary Clinton. There's a lot of similarities between the two. They're both, in my opinion, just very self-involved and indulgent. And we know Hillary Clinton, she still gets the speaking fees and the opportunities to do the little podcast shows and, and all that. And I think Nikki Haley saw that model and she's thinking that she can go that way. I'm just hoping when she eventually does drop out, she doesn't blame being a woman because that would really just end it. She would round all the bases there. She's already claimed that she's experienced racism for being brown and now it's going to be because she's a woman. So falling right in the path of Hillary Clinton, I wouldn't expect anything else. All right, folks, if you're worried about your financial future and under the Biden economy, who isn't? Uh, you should do what I did. I called Bishop Gold Group. You can go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean, or you can give them a call. Actually, I did the call because I, I like to talk to someone. 844-984-1616. And I had a conversation with them about my financial needs, what I was looking for in terms of retirement. Uh, some people want to talk about rolling over an IRA. Some people want to keep precious metals. Some people want them to keep them. Some people want to know how you actually cash out precious metals. But I made them part of my investment strategy. I had a conversation with them. I talked about my financial, where I was and where I wanted to be. And we created a strategy. And these guys know what they're talking about. Integrity is part of their ethos there at Bishop Gold Group. So give them a call 
or go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. If you go to the website, you actually get a special promotion to start your journey toward uh, prosperity with precious metals. But I did it as well. I did exactly what I'm asking you to do. Go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean and find out how precious metals can be part of your future. And like I said, there's a lot of people out there talking about this. These are the folks that I trust. These are the people who I know, know what they're talking about and have your interest at heart. Bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. You know, you brought up Ron DeSantis. When he dropped out, he, he, he made it clear that he thought Donald Trump was the right candidate to get behind, that the people wanted to see a second term. And I think to some degree, whether people agree or disagree, I think that the thinking was about 2028, as you point out. Do you think, though, that the people that were backing Ron DeSantis by and large, are, are, are ready and willing to get behind Donald Trump because the media narrative is, is already shifting to, well, will everybody get behind Trump now and how many people are still outlying? I, I just, I see it that I think people have said, okay, I had my say or DeSantis made his run. It was clear that it wasn't there or his time. But there seems to be a narrative now about whether or not the party is going to coalesce around Trump or not. I think so. You know, I think that social media is a bad representation of any support group, whether it be for Donald Trump or for Ron DeSantis, because you do have those really passionate DeSantis supporters out there. And of course, the very passionate Trump supporters out there. And they've been sparring, of course, for the last six months because, you know, they prefer one candidate over the other. But when you boil it down, Trump supporters and DeSantis supporters, they are all America first. They all want what's best for the country. They all despise what Joe Biden and Democrats have done to their country. Some people that support Ron DeSantis just thought he had an easier pathway to the White House because he hasn't been indicted four times. I was one of the people that kind of fell into that bucket. But we still, and I think I speak for most of DeSantis supporters when I say we still support Donald Trump. We still think Donald Trump would be an excellent president. We were a little worried about getting there and the path to get there, given everything. But I think that you're going to see DeSantis supporters, whether some of them on social media are still salty or not, they're still going to galvanize around Donald Trump, certainly not Nikki Haley and certainly not a Democrat. So I think right now you have people that just have some sour grapes that they got to get over. And I also hope that the Trump supporters that were really vicious to the DeSantis supporters, I hope that they give that up as well, because it just isn't helpful on either side. We're all on the same team. Now we just have to focus on what's going to be what I still believe is going to be a challenge to get back to the White House. Anybody who thinks that Donald Trump's going to win all these swing states and he's just going to clean house. Unfortunately, I think they have some selective amnesia about what happened in 2020, and they don't realize all the cards that are stacked against not only Donald Trump, but any Republican nominee. This is not going to be easy, my friends. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be easy. I was on with my colleague, Jesse Kelly, the other day, and he brought up the fact that it was a little odd that Joe Biden, who wasn't running, he wasn't on the ballot, ended up doing so well out of nowhere in New Hampshire. And I get there was an organized effort. There was a super PAC behind him. But it just seemed like I, I still find it very hard. I have the suit. I have the uh, the ballot here somewhere. Right. I've been showing this all week long. That's the Republican one. Says, I mean, this is the sample ballot. And they had asked people to go all the way down to the bottom, fill out a bubble and write Joe Biden's name on it. And what I thought was weird is that 801, 801, when the last polling place closed in New Hampshire, immediately they declared Joe Biden the winner. Now, Was it likely? Yeah, sure. But here's the problem. And this is what I thought was so fascinating. Not one member of the media had seen a single ballot. And what I talked to Matt Mowers, who lives up there, he's run for office twice in New Hampshire. He said, it's going to take a little bit longer on the Dem side because look, they got 21 candidates on this ballot, right? One of them was Dean Phillips, that Minnesota congressman that was actually making an effort to get out there and campaign. And that the clerks were going to have to go through each ballot and look at the write-in, make sense, and say, okay, what did the person write? I assumed it was going to take a little bit of time. I've been doing elections for 30 years. And yet at 801, Joe Biden's the winner, according to the media. And, And the point that Jesse was making is that if they can make that happen that quick for an effort where he wasn't on the ballot. What else do they have up their sleeve? And how much is the media this time going to do a Russia hoax, a Hunter Biden laptop, whatever. But I think you're on to something. What is the next iteration of Russia, 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 Hunter Biden that the media is going to do this time? 
yeah, we don't know. And it could very well be, hey, do you want your president to be behind bars? I mean, they've been working on this for a long time now, ever since the, the raid at Mar-a-Lago, indictment one, indictment two, indictment three, indictment four, and then everything else that Donald Trump is facing. They've been working hard at this for, for quite some time now, and they know what they're doing. Anybody that sits there, and I get frustrated with Republicans and, and the overconfidence, because I think that that's going to work to the detriment of Donald Trump and the party, this overconfidence and look at the polls. That's the one thing I will say about his victory speech in New Hampshire. I wish there was less of is the gloating and, oh, we're going to win this. The polls, the polls are in my favor, all this stuff. Yeah, that's great to celebrate that. But to be overconfident and to underestimate your opponent, which would be the entire left, the leftist establishment, the media, the Democrats, everything that they've got pulling for them, the DOJ, all these various cases, there's still a lot stacked against Donald Trump, early voting, mail-in voting, ballot harvesting. Republicans are trying to get in the game on those things, but we are very much behind on that strategy. So the overconfidence, I don't think is healthy, and I don't think that it's productive for the movement. Let's just put our head down and get to work and not be saying crazy things like we're going to win New York and New Jersey, which I've heard from some notable Trump supporters. I just don't think that helps to put that out there. Let's just be a little more realistic and get to work. Yeah, there's 97 electoral votes in the eight states that are in play, right? Your Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and New Hampshire. And I, I think it's like, look, he can run up the score there and then we'll worry about the Minnesota, Virginia, New York, New Jerseys that have been a little while. I tell everyone, it, it's interesting, fun fact, um, and I don't say that, but I was one of the last electors for the, the Commonwealth of Virginia in 2004. And that the point is, is that like we got several states that we could probably focus on before we get to the New York and New Jersey's that I don't know that it have ha it's happened in, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, so I, I point well taken in that. I, I want to get back, though, to something that you said. I, you were uh, outspoken for about Ron DeSantis. Since Trump has taken, you know, since DeSantis has has bowed out and uh, urged people to get behind Donald Trump on his side. Have you found any gloating, any negative feelings toward you? Or have you been welcome in saying, okay, Tommy, welcome back to the, the Trump train. Thanks for, for getting on board. You referenced it. Has it been, uh, are you just sort of throwing out a, a, a warning there or have you actually been, been personally targeted? There are some, and I don't, by the way, this is not Donald Trump and his actual team. This is the Looney Tunes that masquerade on social media, who I don't think help Donald Trump in any way. And I'm not going to throw out names. I think those that are familiar probably know who those individuals are that have been so cutthroat, more cutthroat against their fellow conservatives than they have any Democrats or, or right. anybody involved in the Biden regime that have been so cutthroat about this loyalty thing. And I tell them up, down, right and left. I was one of the early Trump supporters when it wasn't cool to be a Trump supporter. I sat there in my days at the blaze as the only one in that building that was a Trump supporter that got laughed at and mocked by my own boss, Glenn Beck, for being a Trump supporter. I have been a Trump supporter. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago in 2020, before Donald Trump got kicked off of Twitter, I was one of the last tweets that he retweeted. So <laughs> I'm as mega as they come, right? There, there is no, oh, I abandoned Donald Trump. I pointed out some things that made me unhappy about what Trump was doing or what he was saying, and I'm well within my rights to do that. And I do like Ron DeSantis, and I do think that he's the future. I also understand that right now this party still belongs to Donald Trump, and I want Donald Trump to be my next president. And if I thought in the early days that it would be an easy road for Donald Trump to be reelected, I might not have even looked at Ron DeSantis. I might have been right in that camp of he needs to wait his turn. But I was concerned and still am concerned about getting back into the White House and having an America first president. And I thought maybe Ron DeSantis had an easier pathway to get there. Obviously, that's not in the cards this year. And that's OK. I'm still Donald Trump. I still support his agenda. And I'm still going to fight with everything I have to make sure that he gets reelected. All right. If you're a longtime watcher of the show, you know about my friend Leo Grillo. He is the founder of Delta Rescue. But it all started one day when he rescued a Doberman. The dog was malnourished. It hadn't gotten the, the help and the care that it needed. Once he rescued that dog, well, it became a lifelong mission for Leo. He created Delta Rescue, named for the dog, right? Dedication and everlasting love to animals. And that has blossomed into Delta Rescue, which is the largest no-kill sanctuary for all kinds of animals, dogs, cats, horses, you name it. If you go to deltarescue.org, you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. Check out the videos. It shows you what Leo has created. 
It's a lifelong mission. And Leo's doing more than just the here and now. He's asking us through our contributions to keep funding it. That's how it completely survives. Five, 10, 100, $1,000 that we can give to Delta Rescue. But he wants to make this a long-term enduring mission. Go check out their estate planning kit there. If you're an animal lover like I am, check it out, download the kit and see if you can make Delta Rescue part of your enduring lifelong mission, your legacy as well. He's doing some great work there. Go to deltarescue.org to check it out and check out that estate planning kit. And if you can, help keep the mission going right now through a contribution. Yeah, when I asked Don Jr. the other day on the show what he thought of it, he said, hey, look, I get it. People had differences of opinion. They came back and I welcome them back. And I, I'm with you. These elections are about addition, not subtraction. When we look at how close these states were, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona. We don't have room. We don't have room to kick people off. If you want to get on the bus, I don't care if you were Frank Biden or Hunter even. If Hunter wants to vote for Donald Trump, I'll take it. We need more votes, not less. It doesn't mean, you know, I I just, I think sometimes people forget that this is a game of addition and not subtraction and not gloating. It's, if you get it uh, and you want to come back, welcome back to the tent. This is what we need to be doing more of. And instead of, to your point, the, the the folks that we're against are the Democrats and the liberals that are trying to undermine us, not our own folks. And I get it that that's, it's just, it, sometimes the priorities aren't straight. But one of the, the forces that you kind of, you mentioned all the forces we're against, I think is the media, right? And I, I was listening to this clip from Abby Phillips the other day. As Nikki Haley put it, I think it's actually such a smart way to put it. Maybe the first person to let, the first party to let go of their 80 year old might be the victor, but who's going to be the one to move first? Yeah. And I think that's where that's where we are as a country, and that's why this is kind of such an intractable problem. Nobody wants Trump, nobody wants Biden, but nobody wants to be the very the first to walk away from either. You know, the irony is, you know who called her out on this? Keith Olbermann. Keith Olbermann, of all people, said, and this is a direct quote, CNN has to address the reality that Abby Phillip has been an absolute disaster and this foot in the mouth editorial is the first thing that she's gotten noticed for since her show debuted. The thing that's funny to me is I don't think that these folks at CNN or, or the New York Times, or the Washington Post get how openly hostile they are to either Trump supporters or to conservatives in general. They don't, they, I mean, this was said on live air on election night. This wasn't a hot mic. Right. Well, you and I actually talked about this on my show. I think it was, you know, even last week we discussed that there are many folks in the media and on the Democrat side of the aisle that just openly not only hate Trump supporters, but they just hate middle America. Let's be honest. They they hate middle class and lower class white people. They just do. They look down on them. They see them as the other. They see them as either white trash or trailer trash or NASCAR people. Everything that they're unfamiliar with and everything that they look down on, that's who they see as being Republicans or Trump supporters. And so they feel like they have to battle their fellow Americans that they never take the time to understand, never take the time to go into those communities, never take the time to understand what rural America looks like or middle America looks like. So they hate Donald Trump. Trump and they hate his supporters just by proxy. Never mind that Donald Trump is actually a New York billionaire. They see these people that have found a home in Donald Trump and they openly hate them. And that's going to be a, a real problem for not only the media, but the Democrat Party as more people are waking up to this. Because there's a whole lot of middle class Americans out there that are struggling right now and they're not finding a home with Biden or at CNN, MSNBC, you name it. It's funny. I mean, you went the independent media route. I, I've obviously been there. It's amazing to me how this continues to grow. I don't think journalists, they always bemoan this fact that like we need to have a, a corporate or a, a public bailout or all of this. And it's amazing. I was reading this story about the the LA Times this week and another billionaire, Dr. Patrick Sing Shun, bailed out the, uh, the LA Times. Obviously, Jeff Bezos is bailing out the Washington Post. Th these guys don't get it that it's capitalism and people aren't buying what they're selling anymore. When the ratings go down, it's not some existential threat from Mars. It's that they, they're they not selling what people want anymore. Their product isn't good. And it's amazing to me to watch the media bemoan the demise of their industry when they're the ones blowing it up. Yeah, and you know, as somebody who lived in LA, uh, I'm not surprised at all at the tumble the LA Times has taken. <laughs> 
I mean, if you look at just some of their headlines, I mean, I, I follow them on Instagram and I particularly like looking at some of their op-eds and some of their editorial pieces about, you know, how about everything is racist. I mean, trees are racist. Hiking is racist. Hiking is for white people. You know, the death of their beloved mountain lion is somehow attributed to racism and classism and transphobia. I mean, you name it. The LA Times has put it out there and people are sick of it, especially in California where things are just considerably worse than the rest of the country. It really is no surprise to me. And then the same thing goes for New York Times, Washington Post. When they're so blatant with their bias, I think it turns a lot of people off and people don't want to read it. It's a tough time for media anyway, especially print media. But when you just openly hate half this country, I don't know how they expect that to go well for them. It, um, I'll get to, to your move later because I, I want to, I want to, you talk about the transition from you were in LA. I'll touch on that in a little bit. So put that aside. Uh, I do want to talk about one of the big issues that the Biden campaign has made very clear. Like they, they were in Virginia at the beginning of the week. Kamala Harris is on some abortion tour where she's, they're trying to make it very clear that uh, abortion and what they call reproductive rights is going to be central to their campaign, right? They want women in particular, suburban women and young women, that would be your demographic, to to come out and vote for them. If th- th- it's been very clear that the way, and I've been very outspoken, I don't think the Republican Party in general has, has addressed this well. What as someone who is is on the right, that they're going to try to message to that the right should be messaging to. What what are you hearing and not hearing on this issue that is ineffective and that would be more effective? Well, I actually think a couple of weeks back when Donald Trump did the town hall with Fox News ahead of Iowa, I thought that he answered this. Oh my uh, God, bless you! I am. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep going, because yeah. I'm so glad you just said that. Yeah, I was really surprised, actually, but I think that he got it exactly right. He said, listen, that's not where the country is. And obviously, I'm summarizing, but he said, when we talk about bans, that's not productive. And, you know, he is pro-life, and we know that he was a very pro-life president, and, and he has a lot of evangelicals on his side, which he's not going to lose. But we have to start talking about this issue realistically. And in the early days of the debates, I will even give it to Nikki Haley that she addressed this issue well, saying it's not realistic to talk about bans. And I've been on the Republican Party for many years now saying that, hey, we better get our messaging right about abortion, because talking about, okay, got rid of Roe v. Wade, that's great, that's all good. We didn't message that correctly. We didn't let folks know that this was about sending it back down to the states. People thought that they were just banning abortion nationwide and the Republicans did it. So that was our first problem. Now we got Roe v. Wade out of the way, send it back down to the states. And the same Republicans that were fighting against Roe v. Wade are now saying, well, now we want a federal abortion ban. But I thought you wanted it to go to the states. And now you're saying now you want a ban. So you're making people fearful. And the Democrats are going to play into that because it worked for them in the midterms. I believe the Democrats won the midterms and so many Republicans lost even if they didn't talk about abortion because of Roe v. Wade and because of our poor messaging on it. So if we want to win, I think Donald Trump, keep doing what you're doing. Maybe stop talking about abortion uh, as a as a collective. And maybe stop talking about bans and and getting rid of abortion altogether, especially removing the exceptions. Let's start making the Democrats seem like the radical ones on the issue. Okay, that's and play that's, it more to the that's what I wanted to say. Where I thought he killed it in that town hall was he said they're the ones that are the extreme. They're the ones who you know this is according to the former governor of Virginia, a doctor. Wait for the baby to come out and then make a decision. They're the radicals because they're willing to kill the baby in eight months, nine months, or even after birth. If you remember the former governor of Virginia, where he said, you kill the baby after the ninth month, or even after it's, you set the baby aside, and you have a conversation with the mother, and if the conversation, can you imagine? But these are the radicals. We're not the radicals. We are not the radicals. Democrats are the extreme on this posi- on this issue, and we've got to start going on offense and putting them on defense. Yeah, no, exactly right. And we've failed to do that. But I think it's also because we have so many factions of the Republican conservative collective, because you've got folks that are adamantly pro-life, and I respect that, but they lead with that. And they believe that, you know, government restriction and legislation is the way to to bring about, you know, their faith. And and I understand it, but it's not realistic. And if we want to do anything to protect life or to protect our country as a whole, we have to win elections. And so to completely just bury our heads in the sand and protect the, pretend that that's not an issue, 
I don't think is helping the cause for anybody in any way, shape or form, whether you are just adamantly pro-life or not. If you lose every election, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get any. Right. So as as sort of the target of that messaging, if you could say to to Donald Trump, uh, who will be the nominee, here's what you should do. Is your answer just do what you did in that Fox Town Hall? Yeah, and I think that you also reiterate that it's a state's issue now, that this is up to the states and certain states are going to defend abortion and and pro-life people are not going to like it, but they're going to do so. And there's going to be states that like mine here in Tennessee that decided, you know, abortion is heavily restricted, if not almost completely banned. And those states are going to do what they're going to do. And people are going to be upset in those states. But the people in the states have the right to choose and and decide how they want to line up on this. And I think throwing it to the states and making it a state issue is going to be the winning message here and reminding people that that's where it lies and reminding folks that, hey, listen, we're not going to have a a federal abortion ban. We're not advocating for it. And if California wants to be radical and extreme, pro-life is going to hate it. But they're going to do that. And here in Tennessee, we're going to do what we're going to do. And I think that's the best way to message it. And if Donald Trump continues with that and focuses more on the issues that are you know, unifying issues like the border and the economy, that's how we win. Hey, folks, let me ask you a question. When things go sideways, are you going to be prepared? As a graduate of the Naval War College and as a former White House press secretary, I was involved in a lot of contingency planning and preparation. The good thing for all of us is that if things go wrong in a natural disaster or we lose power for days, weeks, or even longer, we've got you covered. I want to introduce you to the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It will have you covered. It is so strong that it can actually run your refrigerator. So if you or a loved one depends on medicine that needs to be refrigerated, it has you covered. It runs solely off solar power and a solar panel comes with your order if you go now to fordpatriots.com slash Spicer. Think about it. It may be hours, days, weeks. Who knows that you could be without power? But with Four Patriots, you're covered. Go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer. You never know when you're going to need it. And the beauty is because this entirely runs off solar power and the panel comes with it, you'll be covered taking care of your neighbors, your friends, your family members, and yourself in these critical times is what matters. So with the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, you can run your refrigerator and all of your other devices for hours without having to worry about it. Go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer to get your offer. So you you mentioned the border, right? I, I don't, I don't think we could have asked for a bigger gift this week than the Biden administration asking the Supreme Court to allow it to cut the wire that Texas had put up to prevent people from illegally entering the country. Texas was doing what the government wouldn't do. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, dummies, just sort of the idea that they sued Texas was just so stupid because everyone who has attacked the Biden administration for an open border, they've had some ham-handed response. This time, John Kirby couldn't answer the question in the White House briefing room. He said, like, what are you talking about? And I think it was Peter Deuce. He said, you guys literally sued to cut the wire to allow people to come in. This is where the, the, they should be going, you know, having a press conference a day, just highlighting this issue. I mean, I, I just, I, that was a gift. It was like, hey, we forgot to give this to you for Christmas. Here it is. Yeah. And, you know, I got to say, I feel so badly for our Border Patrol agents because the way that this has been paraded around the media and the way that the Biden administration has played this is that, you know, Border Patrol agents don't want this wire. They want to cut the wire because it's impeding their abilities to do their jobs. Uh, I talked to a lot of Border Patrol agents and there has been, you know, the Border Patrol Union has been outspoken about this as well. It's not the Border Patrol agents that want to be cutting and removing this wire by and large. It's the Biden administration that's instructing them to do so. So I can't imagine how it feels to be them because there's a lot of people out there that are uninformed that think, oh, yeah, Border Patrol is the one that wants to be doing this. They don't. But, you know, beyond that. I think that the Democrats, and, and I'd like to say they were just stupid and they fell into this and it seems like they're they're idiots with this, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to underestimate my, my opponent here. I think they're far smarter than that. I think they understand that this immigration issue is really, really bad for them right now, but I think that they play the long game and they're so smart for doing this. They realize that... You know, Democrats that are going to vote Democrat are probably still going to vote Democrat, even if they've got millions of illegals in their backyard. And they're thinking to themselves, you know what, right now it's a challenge for us. But in a couple of years, when we give 15 million people amnesty and voting rights and they vote for us, 
we don't really care that we had a rough spot in 2023 and 2024. So never underestimate your opponent. You're, you're absolutely right. I keep saying this. It's let them in, give them DACA, and then go, gosh, they've been here through no fault of their own. That's their line. And let them vote. And they become citizens. And boom, here's 10 million, 20 million new Democratic voters. The thing that's interesting is for so long, I feel like Republicans all over, it, it was like fait complete. Oh, we lost the court case. We didn't do this spending battle. Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, gets this Supreme Court ruling against him. Most Republicans, I think, would have said, hey, what do you want me to do? Greg Abbott puts out this statement this week. And he says, he leads by saying, the federal government has broken the compact between the United States and the states. The executive branch of the United States has a constitutional duty to enforce federal laws protecting states, including immigration laws on the books. President Biden has refused to enforce those laws and has even violated them. The result is that he has smashed records for illegal immigration. And this is the end, and this is the key thing. The failure of the Biden administration to fulfill the duties imposed by Article 4, Section 4, has triggered Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, which reserves to this state the right to self-defense. That's the section of the Constitution that talks about an invasion. And he says, for these reasons, I have declared an invasion under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 2, to invoke Texas's constitutional authority to defend and protect itself. Boom. That's what we need more of. Texas Governor Greg Abbott saying, okay, yeah, I got you, Supreme Court, but guess what? Here's the section of the Constitution. We are being invaded. We have a right to defend ourselves. Yeah, and thank goodness he did that, by the way. We need more governors like him. I think Governor DeSantis is similar in, you know, in his approach, obviously not as much of a border state as Texas. So Texas gets the the incoming on this. But, you know, I, I talk about it all week long when this Supreme Court ruling came down. Democrats do whatever they want. Illegal immigrants do whatever they want. Uh, why shouldn't Texas be able to do what it wants to protect and defend itself and then our nation? You know, obviously, thank you, Texas, because they are the gateway into our nation. But I agree with them. And they started laying more razor wire after yeah. this decision. And I think that's exactly what they need to do. If the Biden administration wants to flout our immigration laws and illegal immigrants want to tap dance all over our country, then I think Texas should go ahead and do what it has to do. And Texas should be as cutthroat as the Democrats and the leftists that are looking to undermine our country. So so I say, have at it, go for it, do what you need to do, Texas. And thank you on behalf of the rest of the country. Thank you for doing something. You know what, though, this gets back to uh, the name of your show is Tommy Laren is fearless, right? And I feel like we haven't seen a lot of fearless leaders. And in the last 12 months, something's happened. Something has changed. You see Greg Abbott saying, I'm going to fight for this. This is the invasion. Uh, this is an invasion. Our country needs to be protected. I need to protect my state and I'm not just going to roll over. You saw, I think Mike Johnson come into this argument on spending, not, but, but showing at least some grit that I'm not just going to roll over because the Senate. And then when you talk about like DEI and some of the stuff that's happened at the college universities, it was our side, Elise Stefanik at that hearing saying, tell me what part of the code it's okay to attack Jewish students and, and Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard, and then the president of Penn, ham-handedly not being able to answer that, and then finally getting fired. But it's because people finally got a backbone and said, let's fight. And I don't know what it is. It was like, it, in the last 12 months, I think folks on the right have finally realized, if you stand up and fight, we can win. You've seen DEI stop being talked about so much with these corporations. What, what is it that you think has changed, if anything? Or are they just, we just have six, 10, 18 heroes that finally stood up? Well, I also think that I hope the country learned its lesson from COVID. I think once you have our freedoms be infringed upon the way they were with COVID, I think that there are still many people out there that are unwilling to forget that, unwilling to forgive that. But to me, that was a real turning point. I thought if they're willing to do this shutdown of our economy, they're willing to mask toddlers, arrest parents of toddlers on planes for not wearing masks, force a vaccine mandate upon people to, in order for them to be able to keep their jobs. I think that was a, a turning point for a lot of people. Then we saw them go after Donald Trump, raid Mar-a-Lago, indictments 
one through four, go after this man mercilessly and throw the entire weight of the justice system against him for political purposes by and large. And I think a lot of people saw all these things just piling up and piling up and then the invasion of our country. And I think that there are some patriots out there that said enough is enough. We're going to be remembered in history by how we confront this. Let's not ever like fall for the two weeks to flatten the curve again. And I use that metaphorically, but I think everything that they're doing to us should be in that vein of remember two weeks to flatten the curve, my friends, they lie to you and don't forget because they'll do it again. But, but okay. So fair enough. I agree with you. You start thinking about COVID and what we were, what we went through, but I, there's, I, I just can't figure out if this is a pattern that suddenly you see Abbott standing up, doing something that's completely not normal, meaning I, in a good way, he's like, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to fight a Lee Stefanik fighting, uh, pushing back and, and in us winning Bill Ackman. I mean, like people are saying enough and they're willing to stand up in a way that I don't think that they have before. I think the left made people cower for a while. They, they, there was a point at which I remember somebody who worked for a major telecom company who was trying to speak out against certain things that were happening to their kids. And people were attacking them and calling their employer, trying to get them fired. And people would get scared and say, okay, I can't do that. But now, it, and again, maybe I'm just pulling out the right dots and trying to connect them. But I feel like something's changed in the last six to 12 months where people are saying, I will stand up, I will fight. And there's, I know there's an army behind me that will support me. And I know it seems like a small thing, but, you know, as you're talking about that and and I think that the rights, you know, we're, we're always so and not people that do this for a living like you and I do, but just average conservatives out there who just work and and they pay their bills and they, they want to be left alone. I think that they draw inspiration from realizing that they have more power than they thought that they did. Donald Trump obviously has shown a light on the forgotten American when he won in 2016. But I think another thing that people realize, even if it was a small example, is what happened to Bud Light. I think that a lot of conservatives and Target too, they sat back and, and they watched the power that conservatives could have on this ginormous company. And they realized, oh, you know, wait, we actually do have some influence. And sometimes I think conservatives forget the influence that we have. And I'm talking yep. the everyday conservative, everyday Republican out there. And Bud Light kind of proved it. I know it's a small example. No, it's a great it's a Bud example. Light ad with, it's, it's, it's actually it's a perfect. Still, it, we made a huge dent. I, I think you're right, though. But that's my point, is that I feel like, you know, I remember for as a, as a young campaign operative, I drive around and I'd listen to Rush Limbaugh and we'd hear all this stuff. And, you know, it's kind of like there was a secret group of people that would talk about conservative issues. But now it's like you can be like, I, OK, I can fight back and win. Yeah, and, and we can. And let's just hope, you know, I, I've said this for months now, if we can tank Bud Light and we can put the heat on, on Target and, and the rest of these woke companies that have gone broke because of their wokeness. If we can do that, boy, we should be able to win an election. <laughs> so let's take that energy and let's apply it to early voting and mail-in voting and ballot harvesting where it's legal. And, and let's apply, apply some of that passion to those things. And, and boy, maybe we can win an election. I think that would be yeah, nice. I, and that's the thing is that you give voice to these issues and people know they're behind you. And I, I want to segue a little. So I, because you've given voice to a lot of people. I think there's a lot of young women uh, that in particular that look at what you've done and said, I, look at Tommy. She goes out there, she fights, she's fearless. Um, when you look back at college freshman Tommy Laren, did you, was this where you wanted to end up? Did you say, I want to get out there and, and be a, a, you know, a warrior for issues? What did you want to be at the time? And, and, look at yourself now and say, okay, this is, is this where you want it to be? Or is that, is this sort of been a completely, you know, undetermined ride that you got on? Yeah, no, I've always wanted to do this. I've always had an opinion <laughs> and coming from where I come so if from I asked, in, by in the South way, if Dakota. I asked, like your fifth grade teacher, they would say, oh, Tommy, she always had an opinion. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Everybody would tell you that. I've always had an opinion, but I also, to me, because I come from what, what we talked about earlier, middle America and forgotten America, I'm from South Dakota and growing up, nobody really cared about us. No one really paid attention to us at all. And people like me who grew up where I grew up, it just feels like a lot of the Midwest is largely ignored. South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana. I mean, people don't really care about that part of the country, even though that's where your food comes from. And a lot of the things that you rely on come from. And I thought, hey, like I have an opinion and I'm from this place and I feel like this place needs to be represented more. And so that's why obviously I've been such a big supporter of Donald Trump because he finally recognized states like mine and my home state. So I think carrying that through and that's just what I've always done. And I think young people, they need to realize the power and the influence they can have You know, Biden's out there with a TikTok army of these little brats out there. Conservatives are catching on. And I think that they're starting to do similar things. And that's what we're going to need to be able to fight fire with fire and win is we're going to need more young people that are willing to be maybe unpopular for a while if it serves a greater good. So if you're a young person watching this now, you're a parent or grandparent and saying, look at the rise the, this meteoric rise of Tommy Lahren, what she's been able to do, the audience that she commands, uh, the influence that she has. What, what is your advice to, to that young person or that parent that's talking to their kid and saying, hey, you want to get involved? This is what you do. Well, I always tell parents because, you know, I have a lot of parents that ask me this. How do we keep our kids conservative and how we make sure that they stay conservative? And I say, listen, you might be a conservative parent and you might teach them all the right things. But if you were scared to stand up at a school board meeting and talk about masks or vaccine mandates or, you know, boys in the in the girls bathroom and in their sports, if you're scared to do that because you're scared that other parents or administrators aren't going to like you. Well, your young people at home are watching you and they're watching you have no backbone and no spine and they're going to learn from that. So the best way that you can keep your kids conservative and and standing up for themselves and outspoken is to be that example. And that doesn't mean having to be the loudmouth parent all the time, but when it matters and when it's really important, parents need to do something because it's not enough just to complain about the way things are. Get in there and get to work and your young people will follow suit and they will learn that it's okay to be unpopular for a while. It's okay to stand up for yourself. And sometimes it always doesn't turn out. You don't win all the battles, but at least you fought for something. But, and and more conservatives, young, old, whatever, would do well to, to understand that because it, it really does work if you practice So who it. were those influences for you? Honestly, just growing up where I grew up, my, I come from a ranching family, just very middle-class, hardworking people who you know, always were conservative, but not not heavily into conservative politics or anything, just hardworking people. And coming from a ranching family and watching, you know, what it's like and the struggles, what the economy can do to those everyday Americans, that's where I drew my inspiration. And then, of course, watching the greats and, and watching course, listening to Rush Limbaugh, growing up watching Sean Hannity, and, and even to some extent, Glenn Beck before, you know, um, a lot of those people are inspirations to me. To this day, even I draw a lot of inspiration from the great Judge Janine. She's somebody that I love to watch on Fox News because she is fearless. So I'm still inspired by all these people in this movement. And then, of course, Donald Trump himself. He is also a a big inspiration to me because he is obviously fearless. And so where did that come from? Tommy Lahren is fearless. Is that something someone said to you and you said, I should name my show that? Or were you like, hell yeah, I am. (laughs) Well, uh, originally, I've always liked that name because I think that you have to be fearless and and speak out. And I am fearless in in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things that I fear, by the way, I'm not saying I fear nothing, (laughs) but I really don't fear what people, what people think about me. That's not something that I really fear. People ask me that a lot. You know, what's it like to have people hate you or whatever. It really doesn't bother me. If my family and my friends and the people who know me like me, that's all that really matters. What people say about me online about my intelligence or my opinions or my looks or whatever. I really don't care about those people. So in that way, I'm fearless. But the original name of my show was supposed to be Tommy Lahren is unapologetic. But then media relations said there might be times where you do need to (laughs) apologize. So maybe don't put that. And I said, well, there's very few times I'm actually going to apologize, but that's fine. We can change it to this. I'm also good. Okay. That's interesting. Um, well, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, I, obviously, you moved from LA. You're now in, in, in Nashville, which is where I think a lot of the movement is moving. It's fascinating. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, I really appreciate your time and obviously always uh, enjoy coming on your show. And, and you know, 
you have really done a great job. I, as I, I mean, part of the reason I brought that up is I think you've given a uh, voice to a lot of people, but you've also been a model for a lot of people who want to take this on and say, I want to be fearless. I want to get out there. I want to have my voice heard. So, you know, it, it's been great watching you do that. And, and uh, your success is something that I think so many people should applaud. So I appreciate you being with us and uh, wish you the best of luck as you continue to move forward. Well, thank you as always for having me and coming on my show. And I also know that you have a real disdain for cats. And that's something that I would like to work on. Oh my with God, you no. Because as an animal lover, I would like to see uh, you. First come of all, around. I'm an animal lover. I just think that cats uh, are, are were like a, uh, something that the devil uh, did when God wasn't looking. But uh, this is, it's just true. It's a fact. Uh, uh, we'll have to agree, disagree on that one. But the cats are, are not part of my repertoire ever. Well, maybe never say never. You never know what can happen, but we'll work on that. All the best. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Continue to subscribe. We got a great show coming your way on Monday. Thanks for subscribing to the Sean Spicer Show. We'll see you back here after the weekend. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.